in this video we're going to test for autocorrelation of the errors using residuals from our regression of y on x1, x2, and x3. In column D, I list all 29 residuals. In column E, I've squared all 29 residuals. Remember we used the squared residuals to test for homoscedasticity, constant error of the variance. We can reuse those squared residuals in this test. And the test statistic for autocorrelation is called the Durbin-Watson statistic. Again, it involves squaring the residuals and squaring the difference in the residuals. So we're going to first compute the difference and then square that difference. Now obviously we can't compute a difference here because there's nothing before negative 15.428. So there's going to be one fewer squared difference in residuals than squared residuals. And then we compute the second one, which is 18.76, the difference in these two residuals squared. Compute the third one, which is the difference in the fourth and the third. And then we square the difference in the fifth and the fourth residual, etc. Okay. So we have a column of squared deviations or residuals. We have a column of squared residuals. The next step in computing the durbin watson statistic is to sum the squared residuals. Next we sum the column of squared differences in residuals. And finally, we take the sum of squared differences in residuals and divide that by the sum of squared residuals. And we get a Durbin-Watson statistic equal to 1.69. Now, because this number is close to 2, quote unquote close to 2, we can conclude that autocorrelation is not a problem. Now that is more than reasonable in, a, in the context of this problem because we have cross-sectional data. Meaning we, for a given year, we have information on 20 MBA teams. That's cross-sectional data. Now if we have time series data, or we have panel data, then we definitely want to test for autocorrelation. In panel data, we have MBA teams for the year, we have observations for MBA teams for the years, say, 1995, 1996, 1997, 1998, 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002. In that scenario, it makes sense to test for autocorrelation because bad teams over time generally are bad teams, i.e., LA Clippers. Good teams over time are good teams. LA Lakers. So when we have panel data, multiple years of observations, we definitely want to test for autocorrelation. When we have cross-sectional data and there's no time component, then we're probably going to get a Durbin-Wasson statistic equal to 1.69. Okay. Now the ordering of the residuals is very important. The way we order the observations, the way we order the residuals, will determine the value of the Durbin-Watson statistic. For example, I'm going to order the residuals by the predicted values, and the Durbin-Watson statistic will change. I'm going to move this up the top here. I'm going to move it up to the top. I'll put it right here, for example. There's a Durbin-Watson statistic, and again, it's the ratio of the sum of square deviations in the residuals divided by the sum of squared residuals. So I moved it up to the top here. In this, in this particular ordering, in this particular ordering is equal to 1.69. But if I change the ordering of the residuals, here I have a kind of a, a random ordering, right? The first team in the data set has a predicted winning percentage of 42%. The second team in the data set has a predicted winning percentage of 
The third team has a predicted winning percentage of 33%, etc., etc. et cetera. So this, this data set looks like it's been randomly generated, randomly ordered. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pick an ordering. I'm going to order the, re, order the residuals by the predicted value. Okay, now the first team in the ordering is a team with the lowest predicted winning percentage of 30%. The team at the end has the highest winning percentage. And notice what happens to Durbin Watson statistic when I order the residuals by the predicted value. The Durbin Watson statistic goes to 2.27, which is still close to 2. Okay. So when we have cross sectional data, generally speaking, the Durbin Watson statistic no matter what order we use, is going to hover near 2. Now let me make this point more strongly. I'm going to generate a random number for each observation. To generate a random number for each observation, I type equal rand, parenthesis, close parenthesis. And that generates a random number. And I've done that for each of the observations. Okay. Now, if I hit F9, every time I F hit F9, I get 29 new random numbers. Okay. So, no matter what ordering I use, this Durbin Watson statistic, because this is cross sectional data, i.e., there's no time component, is going to hover near two. So, let's try it. So, I'm going to order based on these random numbers. Now, as soon as I sort this data, it's going to generate a new set of random numbers. So I'm going to go ahead and sort the data. The Durbin Watson statistics 1.94. I'm going to sort it again. I'm going to use a different random ordering. Again, the Durbin Watson statistic changes. Every time I resort the data based on a new set of random numbers, the Durbin Watson statistic varies. But it it generally hovers near 2 because, again, this is cross-sectional data. Occasionally, the Durbin Watson statistic is very, very low or very, very high. But most of the time, the Durbin Watson statistic is hovering near 2. Here, the Durbin Watson statistic is low, but that's rare. Most of the time, it's hovering near 2. Here, it's actually equal to 2. Okay. So, the moral of this story is when you have cross-sectional data, autocorrelation isn't going to be a problem, generally speaking. However, when you have panel data or time series data, you definitely want to compute the Durbin-Watson statistic and test for autocorrelation.